So my name is Tom Hackett. I'm an orthopedic surgeon at the Stedman Clinic in Vail, Colorado. And I've been practicing here for 12 or 13 years almost now. And I have a real sort of subspecialty in action sports athletes, in particular climbers and overhead athletes. Um, I still climb myself, though not at the greater level I used to, um, just as a matter of time. And it's really been a, 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 a really kind of near a topic near and dear to my heart to take care of climbers. I had a pretty big whipper when before I went to medical school and actually broke my leg and I have no health insurance and um, it actually having that injury, I was about to go on this big trip to Makalu and I had this injury and it basically changed everything and I ended up going to medical school rather than pursuing this climbing career that was kind of starting to blossom and so um, getting into taking care of climbers has allowed me to stay connected with the community you know, and connected with a lot of my friends who are still um, heavily invested in the climbing community. So it's, I, I really enjoy that aspect of my practice. Um, and I did kind of a standard medical school orthopedic surgery residency, which is five years long. And then I did specialty training in sports medicine in Los Angeles at the Kerlin and Joe Clinic. And then I did additional training in trauma, um, and then ended up getting a phone call from Dr. Stedman to, who offered me a, a, a job I couldn't refuse. And so I've been in Vail now 13 years. Wow. Wow. And so tell me a little about how your, your advanced training in, in surgery kind of gears yourself towards working with this outdoor population. For sure. So uh, basically it, it means having a real respect for athletes and knowing sort of intimately what the loads and demands are of a certain sport. So, for example, when you go to do a shoulder surgery on a defensive lineman from an NFL team, you're going to approach that very differently than for, you know, a 514 rock climber or a major league baseball pitcher. And even though the surgery may technically be very similar, the intricacies of the surgery are going to be radically different in respect of what that individual needs to do to get back to their sport. And so that might be everything from the rehab that's associated with, with it, which is a huge part, the management of that injury before you ever even get to surgery, which is a big part of it, and then ultimately in the operating room, the tactical execution of the surgical procedure can be very different for a different individual in a different sport. So sports medicine and the advanced training that I've done has been to learn from the best of the best, and I've sought them out you know, years ago, and even today, currently, I still go and visit guys in other parts of the country that are doing cool things that are dialed into the athletic community. Wow. Lifelong so, learning. Yeah, yeah life exactly. Learning. So you're, you're actually going out there as well and, and trying to just deter, decide what's new, what, what, how you're going to change your different approaches and techniques even now. Yeah, even now, I love doing it. We do a lot of research, too. So we have a biomechanics laboratory here in Vail. We have almost 100 people full-time on staff down there. So we've got robots and different types of machines that pull on things and test things and break things. And so we can try on um, different surgical techniques, and we try them in the lab first. And then we actually put them through biomechanical load testing to see if they work and if they're better than what, what we already have. And then that fits in with product development, too, so that we use better sutures and better anchors and better um, devices so that we get better at what we do. So um, that's a big part of our practice as well, is, is actually the kind of scholarly aspect of it. But I love going and visiting other surgeons, you know, even just seeing something really simple that they're doing. It's cool to watch another guy uh, do things. Yeah, and it gives a whole other perspective, I'm sure. Yeah. So, yeah. so let's get into the anatomy then. And I know you're probably asked this a million times. And um, but let's say you know someone comes into your office and they they want to ask you, give me the simple version. Tell me what's going on with my shoulder and my labrum. I see that I, I got a you know I'm an arthrogram. I see that I have on this image that I have a tear here. What's going on? Can you can you tell me the anatomy and, and what, what what would you tell them? Sure. So I can, um, let me kind of break it down in a couple of different ways. So the shoulder is generally speaking a ball and socket joint, right? But the socket is very shallow. So it's not a deep socket like the hip has this big, deep, deep cave of a socket. 
that the femoral head fits into. It's a constrained joint. The shoulder, the reason why we have so much great motion of our shoulder is because it isn't that constrained. So the socket is very shallow. So you get stability and depth to that socket for the ball to fit into from, not from bone, but from soft tissue structures around it. And the number one thing that, that, that we deal with in climbers is probably the labrum. And labrum means lip in Latin. And so it's a lip of tissue, like a bumper, that goes all the way around the edge of the socket circumferentially and then blends into the bicep tendon. So the reason why a lot of people um, have issues that go hand in hand between the bicep tendon and the labrum is because they really blend into one another. So the, the bicep tendon comes in and actually bonds onto and blends into the labrum and then the labrum goes all the way around the socket 360 degrees. Um, so that's where we get a lot of the stability. Then attached to the labrum is the capsule, which is the lining or the wrapper of the joint, and that's intimately associated with the labrum too. And then lastly, the kind of other main thing in the shoulder is the rotator cuff, and everybody's heard about the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is actually a tendon, and it's a common tendon made up of four separate tendons that come together, and they form this one big common wide tendon that's called the rotator cuff. And it's actually made up of the subscapularis, the infraspinatus, the supraspinatus, and the teres minor muscles that blend together to form this one big tendon. And so in the climbing community, the things that really are most commonly involved with guys from acute injuries or from overuse injuries are the rotator cuff and or the labrum, which then goes hand in hand with biceps tendons. So those are really the things we deal with in um, uh, climbing issues around the shoulder. Yeah, and how much, we're going to talk a little about the surgeries in, in a little bit, but how much of the of the biceps long head do you think plays a role in these labral injuries? Because you can have labral injuries from too much motion of the shoulder, you can have them from a trauma, or you can have them from the, from the biceps kind of pulling on that labrum. So do we know how much of a role it has, or what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, that's a great question, because that's kind of one of the topics I'm really working on now. Um, a lot of guys have label tears and they don't even know they have. And so there's this broad spectrum of label tears. Like there's, we have a whole classification system of like type one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different types of label tears. And some label tears are different than others. And so if you end up just getting an MRI that says the labrum's torn, it, it's not enough information. Is it a type one tear, a type two tear, a type three tear? Is it displaced? Is it unstable? Because ultimately, anybody that's climbed hard or climbed for a long time is going to have some problems with their labor if you get an MRI. In fact, we're in the process right now of doing a study looking at the MRI appearance of labrums in north climbers that have no shoulder pain at all. Mm. Because I'm convinced that there's a lot of guys walking around out there that have substantial labral tears that have no pain. Which then means if you go, if you then start having pain, and you get an MRI and it shows a labral tear, the labrum might not be the thing causing the problem, right? So some labral tears can really be silent and clinically, meaning that it's there, but that's really not the thing causing the problem. It might be more of a rotator cuff problem or a scapulothoracic dysfunction or something else within the shoulder. So there's really this huge spectrum of labral injuries, and anybody that has a problem with the labrum that subsequently gets an MRI needs to really have somebody take a close look at that MRI to identify whether it's a labrum that's a problem or a labrum that maybe can be left alone. You know? and, that, and that would be just a huge study in the climbing community, you know, for a landmark study really just to get that baseline of knowing this is what your average competitive climber's shoulder would look like and let's compare that to where you're at right now. And that's, that's exciting. You're able to get that, that research going. Uh, yeah, I've got, I've got a permission to do it through the IRB, which is our institutional review board, and I've got some funding. So we're about to pull the trigger on that study this fall. Because a lot of guys come to me for second opinions, or they've already seen another doctor that's gotten an MRI, and they have a shoulder problem. And the, the well-meaning surgeon, who may not be that dialed in with climbers, says, oh, looks at the MRI and says, oh, you've got a labral tear. I need to fix that labral tear, so let's sign you up for a labral repair. Well, guess what? That might not be the right thing to do. It might be something else entirely that's causing the problem. And labral repairs 
don't always do that well in climbers, you know. So especially if you're starting to get into the higher grades of climbing, a labor repair it has to be done very, very thoughtfully. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's a kudos to you, though, for getting that study out or getting the ball rolling on that because for the climbing community, that's such a huge topic. And as you know, climbers, uh, all of us, we're all nerds on this. We, they know everything about, about anatomy. They'll come in talking about each muscle. And so uh, it's a really big discussion and topic, and it's, it's nice someone's finally um, getting the ball rolling on, on addressing it. So, um, so good for you on that. And so keep in the loop on that one. Definitely. So one thing I always, you know, wonder about too is the biceps long head itself. And the anatomy is really interesting because, you know, in my mind, anatomically, the position of it, if your arm is by your side, it, it's, it's potentially an, an, it's a stabilizer to your shoulder. And, and it could depress or lower your shoulder if your arm's down by its side. But as our arm moves up into different positions, it appears as though the role of the, the biceps changes. And I'm not sure if, you know, as a you know, medical community as a whole, or if we know exactly, you know, the biceps full role in stabilizing the shoulder. But I was wondering kind of your thoughts and, and your opinions on, you know, does it stabilize it? Is it a detriment? Uh, how does, you know, how does it play a role in shoulder motion, especially, you know, arm down by your side versus with climbers, our arms are always above head. Right. Um, Wow, we can geek out on this topic all the time. We can keep this brief, but, uh, but I'm just yeah interested in kind so, of your thoughts. So part of, the short answer to that is that we don't exactly know, first of all, and there's a lot of debate about it. We've done some work in our lab here on motion analysis that, that showed that it really didn't have a significant impact on like humoral head depression, for example, meaning holding the, mm. the down in the socket. Uh, there's been some debate over that. The real and and your point about the position of the arm is, is is very important because when you get into this position here, like if you're up on some uh, all out on Gaston or you're trying to like, what happens is the biceps, the, the arm rolls around and the biceps tendon does this mechanism that we call peel back, and so the biceps tendon as, as it comes in it would normally be attached to the top of the socket, it starts getting pulled posteriorly. And, and rotating around. And so basically what that does is it, it stresses the posterior superior labrum. And it stresses the undersurface of the articular side of the infraspinatus. So that then leads to something we call internal impingement. And we only really see that in like really high-end Major League Baseball pitchers. Exactly. So internal impingement is, is classic in baseball players, pitchers in particular. And I, I see it a lot in climbers. And so whenever I ended up putting my scope in a guy's shoulder and I'm looking at it, I always look for that posterior superior labrum, always frayed, lift it off a little bit, and then the underside of the infraspinatus will be frayed and partially torn. Those things are things that, that are almost always there and oftentimes can be managed with the right type of uh, stretching and strengthening program of the scapula. So just because you see that, doesn't mean you have to go in and start dropping anchors and sutures in that labrum. And that's a mistake that some surgeons make. And, you know, by, you know, they think they're doing the right thing. Well, i got to put an anchor in there. And it's not the right thing to do because that's a byproduct of some dysfunction of the motion of the shoulder rather than a, an acute injury in and of itself, usually. So the biceps plays a big role there because when you get into that position, it's tugging on the labrum posteriorly. Yeah, and it's nice you almost, you almost say that, yeah, pitchers, this is a position they go through as well because there's a big body of research and, and evidence with, you know, with those sports. And so it's nice that, at least for climbers, we can start to take a look at other sports and see the information and research uh, that our arms have to be in that position. And it sounds like the technical aspects of the surgery are much different when you, when you start to look at that. Can be, yeah. Yeah, can be. Yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't think there's that much correlation between, you know, a 5'14 climber and a 100-mile-an-hour fastball thrower, but there was a lot of similarity there. Yeah. That's very interesting. So one thing I want to, before we get into um, therapy and some of the, the research, I want to see kind of from you, what's, what's your specific interest in climbing? What's your push now to, you know, to reach out to climbing community to get involved? Um, you know, I know that you got into surgery or medical school kind of through some of your injuries. 
But are there any, any other things that like really tie you to, to climbing um, as, as a sport? Oh, yeah. I mean, I still climb myself now, not, as I said, as much as I would like, but I love getting up on a desert tower in the fall. And um, so I still love doing it. And then most of my closest friends from, you know, 20, 30 years ago who I used to climb with are now running climbing schools and and part, like, in upper levels of climbing organizations or within the outdoor industry. And so... I stay connected to it through them, you know, and this allows me to, to kind of coordinate with them, you know, beyond just getting together over beer. Like we talk about these things all the time with, with these guys and their fellow guides. Um, so it allows me to stay really connected to that community by taking care of all these guys who fly in from all over the place to come to Vail to be evaluated. Um, you know, and then one of my real motivations on this sort of project of the climber's shoulder is to try to prevent surgeries from happening. Wow. And, that's, you know, huge, that's huge coming from a surgeon. <laughs> I know. Don't get me wrong. I get up in the morning and I love to operate on someone's shoulder, but I only want somebody to have surgery that really needs it. And I've just seen too many guys that had a label repair done, and it was technically done well by a good surgeon somewhere, and they rehabbed it properly, and they just didn't come back well from it because it wasn't really the right thing to do. And so I really want to get the word out in the orthopedic community in, for guys that take care of a lot of climbers that, hey, these labral tears may not necessarily need to be fixed. And so that's a big motivator for me because I've just seen too many guys that didn't have a great outcome, you know, after what was essentially a good surgery. It was just a long surgery. Yeah, and that makes sense. I mean, as a surgeon, you want your clients to be happy. You want them to have good outcomes. And if you choose surgeries on the right people that need it, you're going to have successful, happy clients yeah. and patients. So right. it seems counterintuitive at first, but it makes a lot of sense um, that, that you're doing that. So I want to get into then, let's say a climber comes to you and they're contemplating surgery. And you probably get this a lot and they, they have you know some shoulder pain. Um, is there any factors when they come into you that lead you to say, you know what, you got to get surgery right now? Or any factors that lead you to say, well, go ahead and go try conservative therapy first and then come back and see me. Is there anything that kind of points in either of those directions when, when you're seeing them? Absolutely. And so, you know, basically what, what are the indications for surgery in some of these guys? First of all, I'll try as much as I can to treat someone conservatively and to treat them without surgery, if at all possible. But at the same time, I don't want to waste some guy's time with six months of physical therapy and training and uh, acupuncture and rolfing and muscle activation therapy, whatever it is, if it's going to be a waste of time because ultimately there's some structural problem that needs to be fixed, some mechanical problem that needs a mechanical solution. So the guys that kind of I, I start pushing towards surgery right away or somebody that has usually – an acute injury, like they either had problems beforehand or didn't, but then had one specific acute injury, like I tried to stick this dyno, I didn't make it, my shoulder popped out, and now it's it feels unstable and it's clicking and catching all the time. Like I see that, I'm like, all right, you dislocate your shoulder, the labrum's ripped off, like that has to go back, otherwise you're going to dislocate again. Yeah. And especially with instability, meaning a shoulder that's popping in and out. I usually lean towards more aggressive surgical management because a lot of times um, climbers are what I would call a consequence athlete, athlete, meaning the actual shoulder, the problem is the shoulder's popping out. The shoulder popping out in and of itself is not really the big issue. It's the consequence of it popping out, meaning if you're two days up a wall in Patagonia, like you can't afford to have your shoulder pop out. If you're in a remote part of Pakistan in the Karakoram or something, like you can't afford to have your shoulder pop out in a bad situation. So it's better to be aggressive and fix it and stabilize it so you can trust it when you're in an austere environment. So that's one thing with the instability. The second thing is a rotator cuff tear that is full thickness and detached from the bone. So partial cuff tears are very common, and I'll usually try to treat those without surgery. But if the tear is actually detached from the bone, in a full thickness tear, like that's just not going to get better on its own, and so it's better to fix those. So those are probably the two things um, I really push towards fixing, you know, pretty aggressively. Yeah, and that makes sense too as well. So let's say that you then you make your surgical decision or you make your conservative decision. 
Uh, and let's say you go the uh, conservative route uh, with, with a with a um, climber. How important do you think is the the therapist or the acupuncturist or the chiropractor, the person that they work with? How important is it that they're a climber? Do you feel? Um, I think it's helpful if they're a climber, and it's helpful to have that common vocabulary and understanding of what your passion is. But I don't think it's critical. I think that the therapist is critical. Like, to who, who that person is, absolutely critical to make sure that they're, you know, doing the right thing, knowing when to push, knowing when to hold back. Um, somebody that has a true understanding of the shoulder kinematics, meaning the way the scapula moves on the rib cage, the way it ties into the neck. Like, the therapist is absolutely critical. But I think it's less critical that they're a climber. One of the best therapists I have that I use in the Boulder area um, is not a climber, but she's treated so many climbers over the years like she knows climbing, you know, but you're not going to go like rope up with her. So, but she gets it. So I think that the individual is really key, but not necessarily that they can, you know, climb like you do. Yeah. And it's interesting you, you point out that the individual knowing the scapular movements, the biomechanics of what goes on at the shoulder. Um, how much do you think the injured climber, um, how important is that for them to climb properly or to move their arm on the wall in a proper way that doesn't stress the shoulder? How important is the movement? That's like critical. That's like super key because if you're not, if you're out of balance, your scapula is out of whack, and you're not, you don't have good motion and mobility, then you're going to have to compensate to get your arm into certain positions. Or when you're loading it in a strange position, off like a kilter position, you're going to put something under stress that shouldn't be under stress. You know, when you move your arm up, I know you know this, like if you move your arm up like this, only about half of that motion is coming from the ball moving in the socket. The other half is coming from your shoulder blade moving up on the rib cage. And so, and by the way, your shoulder blade has like 19 muscles that attach to it. Think about that. 19 muscles attached to that, like muscles that come up your neck, that go down your back. Like, if that thing's out of whack, then your shoulder and rotator cuff is all of a sudden going to see loads it shouldn't see. And that's why you get overuse injuries and chronic tendonitis and biceps tendonitis and all these other things. And some of the internal impingement that we were talking about, that comes from the scapula. You know, if the scapula isn't moving properly then all of a sudden everything else gets loaded in properly yeah. and then get overuse injuries. That's at least my perception of it. Yeah, so it sounds like, and I 100% agree with you, is I mean the scapula, the biomechanics of the shoulder are key and being able on the wall to address that and move your arm properly on the wall and even in everyday life, but especially while climbing, um, is important to, to limit these injuries that appear as though they happen almost over time, like this consistent, small micro trauma time and time again. Yeah, so, and they're, like they're, that's what it is, attritional injuries, just a little bit over the time, year after year. Um, and that does, you know, cause chronic pain and keep you off of the rock when you don't want to do that. So you obviously you can't have your shoulder in the perfect position all the time, you know, but you want to maximize the, the efficiency of that whole construct here. Yeah. So one thing I've been playing with with climbers, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this from, from your perspective, but the biceps, you know, as we know, the, the biceps long head can pull on the, on the labrum, you know, and, and cause some, some injury. And when climbers are up overhead, they're all the time pulling, pulling down, you know, with the biceps um, as they're rotating and they're flexing their arm. What are your thoughts on teaching climbers a pattern to extend or activate the muscle on the opposite side, their, their tricep, more so when they climb, on if that has the possibility of taking loads off of the, off of the labrum? Um, you know, I haven't thought about that. that. It makes sense, though, and would certainly be an efficient use of muscle endurance and hopefully prevent some fatigability. But, um, yeah, that might... That, maybe I'll have to check that out in the lab downstairs and <laughs> play around with it a little bit. I've been playing with it. It's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure yet. I'm, this, uh, for me, with, I'm doing it with a lot of my climbing clients, but just the idea, you get a little bit of reciprocal inhibition or the, the triceps turns on 
and then the bicep muscle may relax or release a little bit, um, which may possibly take some stress off the labrum. But uh, I'm not sure if there's been any you know research on that yet. But uh, it'd be an interesting interesting concept. Yeah, not that I know of. I keep at it though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll see. Anecdotally, it's it's appearing to work well. Right now, talking about uh, going to the surgical procedure itself. Um, how does, and I know you've probably been asked this quite a, quite a bit before, but how does the surgery on a competitive rock climber who has to use their arm over their head quite a bit compare to the surgery of someone who just needs to open their refrigerator door or someone that, that's living a little bit more of a sedentary life? How does your surgical procedure change with just knowing that someone is a climber? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, you have to have a very light touch, basically, I think. I mean, you should with surgery anyway, but in particular with climbers, I'm a little more cautious about over-constraining the shoulder, meaning, you know, if somebody is, even if somebody is a football or lacrosse player or, you know, a big-time kayaker, I'm going to treat that labrum and the capsule differently than if someone's a climber. I have a little bit of a lighter touch with a climber, a little bit more respectful, perhaps, of not tightening it too much, not over-constraining it. Because, you know, somebody that just needs to put a dish in their upper cupboard needs to get their arm up here, but that extra, like, five or six degrees of the 10, 20 degrees of the climber needs of hyperextension is key. And so you have to be able to reestablish that after the surgery. And a lot of that comes from the therapy, but a lot of it comes, too, at time zero, with um, the, the, the way that technically the surgical procedure is done when you're kind of reattaching one tissue to the next or pulling uh, the labrum or the capsule back to the bone, it's, it's a matter of millimeters, like a millimeter here, a millimeter there, an extra degree here. And so I tend to be a little more, um, a, little, a little less aggressive with the climber's shoulder than if it was any other type of athlete. Yeah, and by less aggressive, you mean less aggressive tightening it up so much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah you don't want to get wicked tight like that. It's a big mistake. And I can tell you from a physical therapist perspective from after when we see the, the patients after surgery is we can absolutely tell a difference. Um, those millimeters that you talk about of how much that translates into how much work our job is and how much easier the climber is able to get back to, to overhead activities. Yeah. So those, those millimeters not only make a difference right in the, in the OR, but, you know, through the whole therapy as well. Right. For weeks while you're working with them, like weeks and weeks, like one millimeter makes a different week, difference of weeks for a guy that you have to work with. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. so I want to branch now into uh, going into um, a little bit of the return to climbing, um, knowing when climbers should get back on the wall and this is something that you know I have a great interest in with uh, with this progression um, and that there's not really much out there that's clear-cut about when climbers should return to sport which is a little bit different than let's say like a thrower or baseball player um, should return to sport so what's your thoughts in general or kind of specifically and if someone has a, a simple uh, let's see, tenodesis or simple shoulder uh, surgery. Um, what what would be your general recommendation first for return to climbing for timelines? Um, so like a tenodesis, uh, a clean out, some bone spurs taken off, not repairing anything, right? Correct. Correct. So that's a that's a um, that's a great question. So the team part of that depends on the tenodesis technique. We just I just collected. Um, over 500 of my tenodesis patients over a like four-year period of time. I looked and we studied them, and we took out all the patients that had a rotator cuff repair or a labor repair or a slap repair or something that required mobilization. And I went down, and that ended up to be like 100 patients. And then we looked at those patients, and I did zero restrictions on them, like none. Immediate full range of motion, immediate strength, immediate supination, no restrictions at all. And out of about 104 patients or something from that 500, there were two people that had a problem. So wow. that's because I think partly because of the technique 
So, and one of those guys was like doing single arm curls at three weeks with like 50 pounds or something. And the other one just had a bad, a bad fall. So, um, so if you have a technique, and I have a, a pretty slick technique with dual fixation that you can trust, then you can be pretty aggressive with getting people moving right away so that you can establish mobility immediately so that you can get those muscles firing immediately. Maybe not like aggressive strengthening, but at least blood flow and proprioception and the muscles are working. So in that type of patient, I usually get them at maybe six to eight weeks getting back onto in the gym. Okay, so we start mobility and motion right away. And then around about that six to eight week mark, like top roping in the gym, plastic, easy juggy holes, a lot of footwork, just kind of getting your fingers in shape again and getting the feel for the rock again. Um, and that usually will go on for a few weeks. And then we'll get back to climbing again, um, ramping up the grade. You know, but it's really ultimately the longer you wait, probably the better off you are. So we keep trying to find ways to get people back faster because that's what everybody wants to do is they want to start climbing again hard. And basically the longer you wait, the better off it is in some ways. So I'll let people get back nice and easy, but I want the progression to be slow that's over huge. several months before you're actually like really cranking and loading. That's huge. And what about yeah. for a more complex surgery? Um, take, take us through that example of kind of what, what sure. a timeline would be. So a totally different situation if you're anchoring down labrum, if you're anchoring the rotator cuff, if you're doing something where you need something to heal to something else, you just like quadruple the time frame for that. So that's usually, you know, maybe a month of immobilization with some early motion that whatever you can get based on what happened with time zero of surgery. Um, stretching during the second month, strengthening during the third month, working on power during the fourth month. So in guys that I have that I do a rotator cuff repair on, I'll start trying to get them back, um, same type of thing, in the gym, juggy, easy holds, just to get out there, maybe four, five months maybe, and then at six, starting to ramp it up a little bit. But I try to like let them know ahead of time that this is going to be more like eight months, nine months, 10 months, 12 months before you're really back to where you want to be. You know, you have to like wrap your head around that time. Yeah, you almost preempt it and you put it out there that you'll have this return, but it's going to be this gradual progression. It's very smart. So yeah, if you let people go back too soon, you're like, oh yeah, go ahead, get, start climbing 512 again, you know, like you'll get hurt and then you'll have a big setback and it'll take twice as long to come back from that. Yeah, absolutely. So what are your thoughts then? Because I get asked this all the time on indoor versus outdoor when returning. And climbers that are normally outdoor climbers, they'll say something like, I'm just going to be on easy slab. I'm not going to fall, you know, or maybe I'll be outdoor on top rope. Um, interested to what, what your thoughts are. on. Uh, yeah, my thoughts are that there's less variables in the gym other than a knucklehead climbing next to you, you know what I mean? But ultimately, there's just less variables. You don't have to deal with weather, wet rock, sandy rock, bird poop, like whatever it is, you know, there's just less variables. And so personally, I think the gym is better to get back into. Not that you're going to become some gym rat, but it just there's less variables. It's, it's more controlled. You know, it's I, I personally am a big fan of starting out in the gym. Yeah. For sure, yeah. Yeah. I get a lot of people trying to negotiate on the, on the terms. Yeah, but, um, how, um, and then how important, you know, when a climber comes back to see you, let's say for a follow-up, you know, after they've had the surgery, um, how important is it the test that you do that day with them or the, that you do in the office versus what they report versus maybe what a physical therapist may send you? Um, how important is each of those components in, in you kind of determining uh, their return to sport or their next their next step? Right. So let's say that what they tell me, what the physical therapist tells me, what I feel in the office um, are uh, – there was something else I was thinking of just now I just blanked on um, – are, are very important, but the things that I can test in the office 
are pretty limited, really. You know, I can test something and say, yeah, that feels intact, or yeah, that's attached and it's strong. But that doesn't give you anything in regards to the dynamic um, requirements on a guy's shoulder, you know, in the field. And so I take what I see in the office as maybe, I don't know, 20 or 30 percent of that decision making. And then what the therapist tells me, I, I take at least 30 percent or more at, or as in terms of trying to make that decision because the therapist usually has a lot more time with that individual and has seen maybe more subtle progress that I might not necessarily have the time to really evaluate in a clinic visit. Because ultimately for me, I got I, I got you know, I don't necessarily have an hour to spend with somebody to go over every little thing. And so I take the therapist's information, like, that means a lot to me. But then ultimately, it's what the guy tells me. He's like, you know, I, yeah, I went to the gym. I just got on some five nines just to see how it would feel, and it felt fine. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe we could advance a little bit more. Um, and, then, and then that's a big part of it is what the individual actually tells me. Yeah. So. So it's maybe like 33, 33, 33, something like that. Yeah, like a synthesis of, of everything. That kind of... Synthesis, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Well, that brings and me... Oh, yeah. I remember the last thing. The fourth thing I was going to say that's really important is the calendar. Time. Yeah. And so I know, to some degree, how long it takes a tendon cell to bond to a bone cell, right? And no matter how you feel, even you might feel great, but I know that that is not a mature repair yet because it takes a number of weeks for these cells to bond. A, to initially bond and spot weld, and then B, for the fibers of those cells to line up the correct way so that they're aligned with the load that that repair site is going to see. And so even if you feel really good, if you're way back on the calendar and you're like four or five weeks before where I think you should be, I'm going to hold you back. Even if you feel good, your therapist says you're ready, like, I know that tendon isn't ready yet. So that's the fourth thing the calendar. That's a big part of that. Yeah, and that's, that's what you're saying, like, the tissue healing properties. Like, you know the timelines that everything should heal at and, and when yeah. things should be ready. Yeah, that's huge. So, yeah. so that brings me kind of to the, to the last point, um, which is the future, is what maybe the future may hold for, for surgery in the next five to ten years. Um, and are there any guesses that you have or any hunches or ideas or expectations that maybe changes in, in how we deal with these injuries uh, in the next five to ten years? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And we're working on a lot of that here at our labs here. And, um, so, for example, in repairing someone's shoulder, we've gotten really good at like getting a tendon and reattaching it to a bone or taking the labrum and, and, and tightening it up, or putting the biceps where it belongs. Like the actual mechanical fixation, um, our techniques for mechanical fixation are fantastic. They get better all the time, but the anchors are like truck or strong. The sutures will never break. The knots we tie are not coming undone. Like the actual mechanical aspect of that repair is rock solid. So the mechanical, the mechanical environment, is like we'll probably get a little better, but probably not that much better than what we have now. I'll tell you what's what the future is in the next few years is the biologic environment. It's all about biology. So that means like platelet rich plasma and stem cells and growth factors. And that's where I think we're really gonna get more accelerated and better healing is with um, ultimately with stem cells probably or some stem cell type variant. Um, so if we can jumpstart the biologic environment to heal properly, that's when things are going to get way better. And we're, we're not there now, but we're working on it. And I think that hopefully in five years or more, we'll have something down, you know, but the FDA is really hard to work with. Um, in the States, yeah. States, yeah, yeah. So there's certain guys like in Munich or other countries where they don't have as much of a regulatory process to, to go through, and they're, they're doing some cool stuff. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. So awesome interview, really, uh, really good information. You interview so well, and this is, I mean, your passion. Just like I am with this topic, I can tell how passionate you are about it. So it's uh, great information. It's going to help the climbing community a lot. Are there any last words that you have, or any last um, things that you want to 
just say on the topic of, of labral surgeries or labral injuries or shoulders in general, just for climbers to know? Yeah, I mean, I would just say that um, a little preventive maintenance goes a long way. And if you're starting to get some tweaks in there, seeking out like some input and some time with somebody that knows what they're doing, typically with the right physical therapist, is going to go a long way towards preventing injuries from happening in the first place. I mean, that's number one for sure. And then number two would probably be is if you do have something substantial left with your shoulder, um, I'd look around before you just go with the first guy that says you need surgery. You know, that's all. Most orthopedic surgeons are really well-meaning guys that are trying to get you back to doing what you want to do. But um, you want to try to find somebody that knows something about climbers or at least overhead athletes. And if someone's, like, trying to push you down, saying you need surgery right away, it might be good to get another opinion.